In his excellent BBC lecture, The Science of Doctor Who, presented at the Royal Institution London, Professor Brian Cox discusses his wish to travel back into the past so he could be present at Michael Faraday's own lecture on the chemical history of the candle, held in December 1860. Referring to Einstein's relativity, the warping of space, slowing of light clocks, Minkowski's interpretations of this, and the tipping of future light cones, Professor Cox ends his talk by asking, could we design some configuration of matter and energy that would curve the light cones around so that I could get back into my own past? He concludes that at present the answer is we don't know, but nobody has been able to prove that space-time geometries similar to this cannot exist, at least in principle, although most experts believe that they must in some way be forbidden but there's still the faintest possibility. This video aims to resolve this issue by rechecking some fundamental assumptions, hopefully simplifying the some way in which they may be forbidden, while also dispelling much of the confusion and apparent paradoxes surrounding the theory of time. Fundamental to the talk is Einstein's widely accepted and thoroughly tested theory of relativity. Amongst other things, relativity tells us that objects, for example clocks, will in fact run more slowly than expected if they are in an area of strong gravity or moving at speed relative to an observer. With these conclusions, the professor explains that many scientists, and in particular Albert Einstein, were forced to re-examine our intuitive picture of space and time. This led Einstein's colleague and tutor, Hermann Minkowski, to develop the idea of the light cone to help visualize how four-dimensional space-time might work. And to write his now famous obituary for the simple tick-tock of the clock. From henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Given the time-related challenges presented in the science of Doctor Who, and seeing how relativity is critical to the conclusions, paradoxes and questions presented, it makes sense to recheck Einstein's most basic assumptions. So, we find at the start of the translated version of On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, Einstein's first paper on special relativity, he rightly states, we must be quite clear as to what we understand by time. Einstein then explains, if, for instance, I say, that train arrives here at seven o'clock, I mean something like this, the pointing of the small hand of my watch to seven and the arrival of the train are simultaneous events. This at first seems to make perfect sense, but on closer inspection it may contain a significant oversight with far-reaching consequences worth examining carefully. Objectively, we can see that all Einstein has actually described here is the fact that an object, be it a train on a track or a hand on a numbered dial, can be in different locations, moving or stopped, and that their locations can be compared. But habitually, we seem to see the location of a train on a track as being one thing, while the location of a hand on a numbered dial as being something to do with a thing called time. But a clock, like a train, is just a collection of matter that intrinsically only proves matter can exist, move and interact where energy is available. However, we might still claim that even if there is no past or even future, things still take time to move and without time the universe would be completely static. But this statement alone might be seen as just invalid, circular, self-confirming logic. Consider the statement, things take time to move, things definitely move, therefore time definitely exists, might seem to be okay. But logically, it is just the same as saying, things need magic to move, things definitely move, therefore magic definitely exists. In other words, one can't use the conclusion of a hypothesis as its own basis. Things may indeed need time to move, but the statement or declaration things need time to move, without supporting evidence, proves nothing. Whether time actually exists or not, it is important here to note that whether he is right or wrong, 
Einstein has only assumed that as an object is moving or stopped, a thing called time also exists and is in some sense passing. We should also note that he points to no actual proof of this assumption in electrodynamics itself. The problem here is that we tend to naturally accept Einstein's assumption that time exists without querying it for the fundamental reason that we, like he, tend to instinctively agree that we can remember the past. But scientifically it seems fairly obvious that however we personally feel about it or describe it, a human memory is in fact just a formation of matter held in our brains. And as such, like the ink on a photograph, all memories intrinsically prove is that matter can exist, move and change and that in places it can be coaxed into stable physical formations. Given that even our own personal memories may prove only that matter can exist and change and that Einstein does not point to a proof that extra to this there is also a temporal past existing or being created or that time exists and passes alone it makes scientific sense to check and dismiss if possible another option specifically what if the matter in the universe just exists moves changes and interacts in other words what if there is absolutely no past ever actually existing or being created in any way anywhere at all what if things just move not heading to a future not leaving a past behind them Simplistic, or far-fetched as it may sound, one should always check logical possibilities, and in all my research into time, no expert seems to have considered this simple possibility, let alone considered and disproved it. Specifically, concerning the science of Doctor Who, the question is, if things in the universe just exist and change, would this possibility be enough to mislead us into wrongly assuming the past exists and yet still explain all of our genuine scientific observations. If this possibility is obviously wrong it should fall apart fairly quickly so to test this we apply it to special relativity and Einstein's famous light clocks. With light clocks the great man shows us that a photon trapped so as to constantly bounce between two parallel mirrors makes a simple and excellent clock. He also shows us that, given the speed of light is constant, the photon in a moving light clock must travel diagonally to complete its ticks and must therefore tick or change intrinsically more slowly than expected. This conclusion applies to all moving objects in the universe and is not just theoretical but proven throughout science and is, for example, fundamental to the accurate working of your in-car GPS system. Furthermore, as Professor Cox explained, Einstein shows us that at the speed of light itself, such a light clock will in fact stop ticking, implying that time itself can even be stopped. Special relativity thus gives us the idea that if we could exceed the speed of light, we might be able to go back in time such that Professor Cox could indeed meet his heroes. Though in the same breath, the standard interpretation of relativity is said to protect us from actually traveling back in time because of the speed of light barrier. The problem here is that the light clock seems to scientifically prove that time can be slowed down. And if time can be slowed down or even stopped, then of course time must exist. However, this again may be a questionable conclusion. If we consider the light clock objectively, we can see that logically a photon trapped between two mirrors again only actually shows us that matter can exist, move, change and interact. And while the device shows us a very unexpected dilation in its own rate of change, it alone in no way also demonstrates that as matter or photons move, a thing called time passes or that a past record of all events is created or stored in another dimension. In other words, just calling an oscillating machine a clock and claiming time is that which clocks measure in no way counts as a scientific proof there is a past or indeed a thing called time. It is only if we assume time exists that we conclude the device shows time passing and that this time thing may be dilated. 
If we only assume that matter exists and changes, we can see that perhaps just rates of change are dilated. The key here is to see that we may be so distracted and fascinated by these exciting and genuine conclusions that a moving device runs more slowly, that we automatically assume that all the facts leading up to them must be correct. And thus we incongruently may be jumping to the conclusion that we have also proven that there must be an invisible fourth dimension to the universe flowing intangibly from an invisible future to an invisible past. So what might a question like this mean if matter just moves and changes? Are the doors to the past firmly closed? Perhaps the answer is neither yes or no, because the question may be invalid and misleading, wrongly implying that the past definitely exists, and our only problem is can we access it. If there is no time or no past, then we still need to reinterpret the question and present a working answer. To do this, consider the actual live transmission of Doctor Who, Episode 1. We may assume we cannot watch this original transmission because it is over or in the past, and the time-based interpretation of relativity suggests we cannot go back in time to see it because we cannot exceed the speed of light. But if we consider the situation without time, we still find relativity's insights into the speed of light play a critical role. As Professor Cox himself explains, the actual transmission of the first Doctor Who constantly exists. Scientific and common sense tell us it is presently an expanding shell of electromagnetic waves surrounding the Earth at about 470,000 billion kilometers away and with a thickness of around 1,000 billion kilometers. So, to watch this original transmission, you need only accelerate away from the Earth through and past the transmission itself and set up a TV with a very good aerial. However, although this episode still genuinely exists, it is also actually impossible to watch it, not because the episode is in a temporal past and the light speed barrier prevents us from going back in time, but purely because the transmission itself is physically too far away and the light speed barrier prevents us from catching up with it. If special relativity might not prove or require time, then what are the more complex findings in general relativity? The fate of Rufus Hound, apparently doomed to a time-distorted spaghettification as he approached the distorted space-time of a black hole, leading to possible temporal paradoxes, might be simplified and understood in another example, without time, by considering this similar scenario. Here we consider the famous wormhole billiard ball paradox, in which it is suggested that a billiard ball might enter an area of distorted space-time, i.e. a wormhole, and continue through the distorted space-time, such that it might exit the wormhole in the temporal past and at a location and direction allowing the ball to impact its earlier self. The problem here is that thus the billiard ball might be able to come out of the past and prevent its present self from ever entering the wormhole in the first place. This is precisely the kind of configuration of matter and energy that Professor Cox suggests nobody has been able to prove cannot exist, at least in principle, although most experts believe that it must in some way be forbidden, and which might curve the light cones around me so I could go back into my own past. However, bearing in mind again the possibility that perhaps just matter, motion and warp space exist, the following interpretation and solution offers itself. First we consider that like Rufus, the billiard ball is indeed spaghettified as it enters the intensely warped space of the wormhole. But in this case, the process continues such that the spaghettified billiard ball is thus stretched to be both at the entrance and exit of the wormhole. As this process continues further, the ball is indeed able to meet and impact itself in countless different ways, but none that prevent its continuing entrance into the wormhole. Thus, it is not the case that the accessible future of the ball ends up pointing to its own past, but that the front of the ball, technically moving straight ahead in warp space, is able to impact its own rear. So we can see that while in the space-time view, 
Most experts believe certain space-time interactions, e.g. the ball preventing its own entry into the wormhole, must be in some way forbidden for unknown reasons. In the timeless view of the experiment, the interaction of the front of the ball deflecting the rear of the ball from entering the wormhole is not forbidden by time or some chronology protection conjecture, but by simple common sense object collision physics. And, unless proof is given that extra to distorted matter and motion, time and a temporal past actually exist, it would be unscientific to just assume that any part of the ball exists in different times. It's interesting to note here that if there is no time, then there is no direction to time. Instead, events just happen in simple physical directions. Then we see how, on a subatomic or quantum scale, matter may change between different forms perfectly, but an aggregate like a vase obviously smashes irreversibly as it hits a flat surface directly in its path. Therefore, as Rufus heads for disintegration near a black hole, it may well be true that the rates at which things change along his spaghettified body vary tremendously, but this may just be happening, with no part of him in any past or future. So in conclusion, what might this mean to someone wishing to go back into the past and meet, say, Michael Faraday? How can we reframe this question and still answer it with some kind of a meaning if the past does not exist? What if people or objects that we know about but which apparently no longer exist, surely they are unreachable because they are in the temporal past and thus proof of its existence? Well first consider sitting in a closed room with a treasured photograph and ceremoniously burning it. As you do so, the photograph will disintegrate into minute particles of smoke and atoms, but science will tell you the entire photograph is still in the room and still visible if you so desire, though not in a formation that resembles any similar mental image or memory of it that you may have. And again, all this proves is that matter can exist, move, hold formations or disintegrate. Conversely, the idea that as the photograph burns, some other perfect version of it in some way exists and is automatically and safely drifting back into a fourth dimension does not seem to be observed, and therefore should not be accepted as scientific fact unless actually proven elsewhere. As with many situations, there is good news and bad news. The bad news is that likewise we can consider that anything and anyone, including Professor Faraday, is either integrated or disintegrated or in either process. The good news is that thus the matter and energy that makes up Michael Faraday in fact always exists and, unless proven otherwise, is probably not also duplicated in a temporal past. This means there is no need for Professor Cox to prove the existence of time and travel back through it to meet him. Instead, perhaps the meeting is constantly always happening, though it's not as distinct and tangible as the professor may have hoped. If time exists, then it is a truly amazing thing, but if it doesn't, isn't it equally amazing to think that the entire universe might be timeless? <laughs>